Okay, okay. So for today's class, we will be going just to deepen our understanding of uh, large language models and uh, text-based image generation models as well. So maybe before I start a presentation, I have a short presentation and maybe some practicals that we can do. Um, for those ones who are in Yebebal, introduction to the challenge um, this morning. Did you get an understanding of what maybe large language models are? Could you share with the rest your understanding of large language models? Is there anyone who cannot hear me clearly or it's just internet? Guys, is it just continuing? You cannot hear me clearly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think large language models are used to uh, to generate images and tests from maybe you've gone. To generate what? Sorry, I didn't get that. Images and tests. We use them to generate images and tests. I don't know if I'm right, but it's just what I think. I'm not sure I'm getting that correct. You're saying to generate a text? Yes, text. Okay, okay. And uh, who can explain, maybe just uh, just to engage you exactly what large language models are? Uh, I think there are kinds of models. There are models, of course. And um, I can, I don't have a, a deep understanding of them, but what I can just say, I think there are models that we use to maybe extract or, yes, information from uh, a prompt, and the outputs can be a test or an image, image test. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you for that. So maybe before I continue with my question, uh, am I not audible? I see that I'm tuning and let me come out as well. Is that for everyone? Hello, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Let me let me log out and log in with my account. Let's see what works. Okay, I'm back. Testing again. Uh, is it better? I've switched to mobile data. Is it better? Okay, so as I was saying, I'm, I think most of you have been out here. I'd just like to get a general understanding what what you have understood, maybe from reading the document, maybe the reference papers. What are large language models? What is your understanding of a large language model? We got a response from Josias, and uh, he was saying they help us get uh, text 
or images yes and tina uh what i understood is that uh, a large language model just uh, like are huge uh, they use uh, a lot of data and the models are also have like a large number of parameters that uh, um there are from what I understood, there are different um, kinds of them. Like some can take uh, text and produce uh, drawings, for example, and that's my journey. But there are other kinds um, that produce different things, like uh, can do classifications or, um, I don't know, sentiment analysis as uh, before, I think. Well, that's what I understood so far. Okay, thank you for that, Jenna. So I think I'll just go ahead and share my screen and I'll elaborate on what both Tina and Josias said. So yeah, it is true that large language models, they're just like any any kind of models we've been training from right now. But the big, the main difference is one, the parameters, the number of parameters as Tina said, and the fact that these models are trained on multiple data like a large amount a large amount of data so you could, the way internet is saying you could have one one data set for classification no one model for classification another model for i don't know just text generation image generation there could also be just one single model that does everything and all it will maybe be doing it's just doing some form of in context learning Depending on the prompt that you give it, it's going to give you some type of output because it just gets the context and it uh, understands what's going on. So maybe let me see. Okay, so let me just share my screen. The presentation that I'm going to give now it's uh, in the folder as well. So if you can follow along. You can follow along if you want. Okay, so I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so as I was saying, I uh, will be looking at two things, the large language models, LLMs, and uh, MTNA and just as I've given us a brief introduction of what they are, what they could be, and we'll also look a little bit about the text-based image uh, generating deep learning models. So just to start with the LLM, as I was saying, uh, they're basically both the LLMs and the one for image text-based image generating models. They're both the uh, deep learning form of, of algorithms. They use some form of uh, deep learning architecture, like, um, I'm not really sure, but when I say deep learning architecture, I mean like, for example, last week we did use LSTM. LSTM is an example of a deep learning uh, algorithm. So most of these large language models, they use that kind of neural network kind of training so that they can achieve their, their capability. And as I was saying, the main important thing the major big issue about them is that they're trained on enormous amount of text data. Let's focus on the LLMs. So they are they're they are trained on an enormous amounts of the text data. So something else just to mention uh, language models and how we use them. We can use them for like a different type of scenarios, like classification, embedding, and Whatever type of scenario we used, we can maybe like broadly classify them into like a zero shot kind of scenario or maybe like a few shot, a few short kind of scenario. And the, only dif uh, the main difference between what a zero shot scenario mean is uh, you basically have the model and then you just give it a prompt. You've not given it any knowledge. Maybe for example, the model was trained on, on novels, science fiction kind of novels but you don't know that. And then you just, you're given this model and you give it, uh, you give it a text or a context maybe in like a romantic kind of novel. So you've not given it any example. It will just have to use the kind of question you've given it, the kind of prompt you've given it. 
try to learn depending on what it has already seen and give a very educated kind of output. So the difference between the zero shot and the few shot is that in few shot scenarios, we're actually going to give it a few examples, then it will detect a pattern in what you've given it. And then of, of, of course, using its uh, pre-acquired, pre-trained pre -trained knowledge, then it's going to predict the output. So for those who are in, uh, I hope most of you are in Yabibouts, uh, some examples like the few short scenarios, you noticed at some point when he was using the Cohere platform, he was, uh, he, there's a point he was inputting like a number of inputs. Like uh, I think the one that comes to my head now is uh, when he did the poem. So he did give an example of a poem and then was expecting some form of output. So that example of a poem, immediately you give an example that represents a few short kind of scenario. You could go ahead and instead of giving it an example, an example point, just go to that model and we are going to look at that yeah. playground in a few and just uh, experiment with it. You could just say, okay, give me a poem. And then, so it just gets your prompts. So, yeah. so you need a poem and it comes up with a poem from anywhere. And uh, just give you the answer. So this is asking again the difference between zero shots and two shots. Is there anyone who has gotten that difference? Clearly, maybe we could hear it from someone else's uh, mm -hmm. understanding. Mm -hmm. Then we can all just mm -hmm. yeah, come up with a conclusion. So anyone, oh. if you have, yes, Sentinel. Uh, yes, so zero shot and few shot is uh, the difference between them is uh, if you give it an example or not. So if you don't give any example, just ask, uh, uh, for output directly to your shot and if you give an example or several examples um, then it's a few shot scenario well is that correct yes thanks in turn yeah that is very correct the only difference actually let me just let me exit here and i have opened a coherent platform maybe i think it will be better if we just uh, learn and practice as we go so I hope you've actually gotten access to this platform. I think I have opened one somewhere here. Let me just see why. Yes, I have a platform here. And when we say an example of a zero shot, zero shot kind of scenario is when you come to this platform, you notice it's using a model. You say it's using a model. Uh, something, just a specific model. It is using a model. It has a number of tokens. So you just come and say, what is my country? And you just type in, what is, what is my country? So that's, that's the prompt. That's everything you've given to the model, nothing else. And you try to generate an output from your prompt. And it gives us a, some kind of an answer like, what is my place in the world? How do I fit into the world around me? So there are so many questions. Yeah, it, it's tried to be intelligent, that you intelligent, and just give you an output based on the input that you gave it. That's an example of a zero shot kind of scenario. But for example, if I was talking to a human being, maybe I was talking to, I don't know, Emtinan, and I asked her, what is my country? Maybe I'm expecting a response like Kenya. So this model does not know that. It just gives an output depending on the input that I provided. So instead, I could go ahead and give it a number of scenarios. Like, for example, yeah, I know I want it to, I want it to give uh, my country as Kenya. So I can just come here and give it a few examples. Yeah. What can describe Kenya? So you could make your inputs, your examples as discrete, or uh, it doesn't have to be so discrete, but just something that is unique to the place that you are trying to say. So maybe, for example, we give it an example of, um, so we give it a question, and maybe the question is, who is my president? I don't know if I want to add that, because now we are going through a power shift. I don't know which one it will take. So let me try, um, uh, what's my, let, let me try with the, let me just try the president, maybe and use the former president. So who is President. Then I give it an answer like uh, so let me go with the previous. And then 
I go with like another question and say, uh, I don't know if it recognizes stripes. Let me just try a tribe if you recognize. So, what is the tribe? Maybe go with an answer like uh, a decoyo. So, for those who are Kenyans, you know that's a example of a tribe. And then, so I don't know what else could be unique. Let's just try the two. We've given two examples. So, you notice that this is a question. And we want an answer from this. So, we want an answer from this. And we've given it two examples. So, if I try to generate that answer, yeah, what is my country? It did give me an answer called Kenya. Okay, so of course it's giving me a lot of outputs because of the number of factors that I did not restrict. So if I just, let me, I don't know if it will start from here. So let me see. Exactly, it even gave me an example of like a Swahili. I don't know what that, they were trying to say that. But point is they did get my country. They did get my country as Kenya. So this is a different output kind of what I expected compared to when I just asked what is my country. So that's the difference. What is my country is just zero shots, giving it just a question and expecting it to do everything. And when I give it some example, this is an example of a few shots kind of a scenario. I hope that makes it clear, Joseph. Just yes, I hope that makes it clear. Yes, yes, it's clear. Okay, so a few examples of the LLMs models out here. Like, for example, what I've just used, we have that Cohere platform. Of course, it has a number of large language models, but we have the example of that Cohere platform. We've also heard a lot about GPT-3, which is what we are kind of introducing in this suite. Like, we could say they're like big in this area. So the, the company actually is the one who's big in this kind of large language models. Open AIs and they have they have very different they have different types of large language models like we have the GPT-3 we have the Codex and we also see at a text based um, image generating model that they also have so here I've just uh, added a few examples of large language models and um, they all do different things like you notice over here we've just seen generating text just generating like an output we. Oh, he also has a way of like doing classification, maybe just word embedding, and uh, we just look at these examples. So what happens in a large language model, how it works? I've written architecture-ish, because it's not the architecture. It's just uh, something to understand. So the large language model has actually already been pre-trained with a large corpus of unlabeled text. So it's been given lots and lots of data, not labeled, just for it to learn. And then after going through a learn, it comes up with this language model, which is now what we are using now, the large language model. It has already been pre-trained. So sometimes, like most likely this week, you might come up with a few, you might come across a few words like uh, fine tuning. So fine tuning in terms of LLMs, it's like you notice the large language model we've just used, we could literally give it any question, any inputs, and it will give us an output because of the number of data it has actually been, been exposed, exposed to. But then let's say for this week, you want to focus on extracting insights from job descriptions. And maybe you have a specific labeled data that maybe shows like this, this job description is for data engineer this job description is for machine learning engineer this job description is for a web engineer so you have labeled data already so you could as well fill your labeled data into this already pretend large language model whatever model and it gets the context of your um, of your labeled data and then when now you get your fine-tuned model so it's the original model given label that then it becomes a fine-tuned model. So when you get that fine-tuned model from maybe a platform like uh, GPT-3 or maybe Cohere, after you do some fine-tuning, they will just give you like a code to your fine-tuned model, and you can just import that model and then maybe do some form of now testing. 
with the just in time of data. I hope, I hope that is clear as well. Yes. Yes, and Tina, the fact that you are giving it unlabeled kind of text, that means it is an unsupervised uh, learning. And as I had said mainly, most of these models are trained with deep learning algorithms. And most of the time, a deep learning algorithm is a form of an unsupervised kind of learning. So yeah, the training happens on uh, unsupervised kind of, of learning. So the reason as to why LLMs are used like why LLMs in the first place. And uh, no, 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 let me say like, like the advantages that LLMs gives to us or uh, just the advantages why we use them. It's because one single LLM, as I had mentioned, can actually function for multiple tasks. If you use one single LLM and do some form of translate, you would maybe do some form of text generation. Maybe just to show you the kind of, uh, the kind of um, whatever we were just doing, we were generating some text. We could also go ahead and use the exact same model without changing and maybe do some form of translation. And I want to be to translate the following uh, sentence to span, let me see, to, to French. To French. So my input becomes, let's say, how old am I? How old are you? Let me say how old are you? I think I know, I know the output for this. Nope. That didn't work. Okay, so I can select the current page. Question. Actually, I think I'm putting it up on translate. I'm to translate to French. Working. Let me try the few shots. Let me try the few shots kind of approach. See if it's going to work. So, how old are you? Oh my god. There should be something like, uh, I don't know. So, of course, I'm on, uh, I am on, um, On my desktop, I can't write the app source. So let me just let me see another question I'll write. So, so let's see an example of uh, what is your name? So be like I don't know what kind of question would we ask it now. I don't know. Anyone give me a statement? I'm thinking of statements that can come down in my head. Let's see. How are you? How are you? To see what's going, it's going to give us an answer. Okay, it's something, it's something close. Something close, but I hope you do get the idea. So let me just, I think we gave it a given this. Yeah, but you guys see, at the end, you get the logic. It did give me again another question and another answer. 
I wanted this answer. So let's just see. Como Talejo, exactly. So we did not get the translation we were looking for. And this is the exact same model I was using to generate some text. So we also generated some text. But since it recognized the pattern being English, French, English, French, the output came out as a translation. So Enoch is asking what makes an LLM large apart from its land parameters. And uh, the main thing is the enormous amount of text data that it has been trained on. So it's in different, different contexts. You may just use it for, for maybe predicting or classifying a job description kind of data. But it has seen a job description kind of data. It has seen novel kind of data. It has seen any kind of data that you can think of. So yeah, that's what makes them makes them large. But the other the other good thing about LLMs is that the more you continue to train, like what you've just seen with our model, it continues learning and it continues to improve its data as it continues to see more data. So LLMs tend to do that. And then finally is that you can actually make a decent kind of prediction when you just give it a few labeled examples. Like, for example, you notice for the few shots, I was just giving it two examples and I get the output that I want. So even for this week, whatever the labeled kind of data we've, um, you guys have been given, it's not that huge compared to whatever what it has already seen, but just with that small labeled example, you can actually get a good uh, decent kind of Okay, so to look at just some of the ways you can use LLMs, we have like question answering, we've already seen that. We have things like translation, we've seen translation, we have learning understanding. So you, you have seen it does understand the language of French. So you also have summarization. You could actually give it an entire, an entire whatever, an entire paragraph or like one page and then look for a summary of that. And it goes ahead and just gives you a summary of the entire page. Code completion, code completion, that is exactly like uh, API's codex. It does code completion, and I'm sure you guys have actually seen LLMs in action, but you didn't know that LLM was what was doing it. For everyone who this VS code, and they have like the IntelliSense, the IntelliComplete, that is just LLM working behind because it has seen, it has been pre-trained on a large number of code. It has already seen a lot. A lot of course. And so just all the examples of the few things you can do using LLMs. So just to go in a few applications, I've told you like um, the GitHub Copilot. This is actually powered by the codec that I've just told you. Because GitHub Copilot is like uh, managed by Microsoft. So you know that this is a big thing. Actually open AI, they do a lot of research for Microsoft. So you'll find that most of their most of of their, should I say, products are actually being used by Microsoft one another. So I've just added here some form of a GIF for you who don't know an example of like um, code completion, what happens. It could be as simple as, as just finishing the name. Maybe I, I know in VS Code, when you do a function, it tends to generate for you like a doc string. But in some cases, as you can see here by GitHub, Copilot, it can actually generate for you an entire function. Everything needed is that function. As you can see in, in here, we have uh, the authentication. If I can stop this GIF. So you know, for maybe if you are if you are connecting with Twitter, there's always the same thing you give to your functions. Maybe you give it an, an API, an API key. Maybe you give it a user authorization. It's just the same. And it has seen this because it has from different codes, and so it can just generate that. Okay, so um, you're asking, Gideon is asking if if we give it an encrypted and decrypted text as input, will it then decrypt similarly encrypted text? I think it's good. It's just a matter of, I don't know how accurate it will be, but she I think it's good because it's just, I don't know, 
it could notice the type of authentication key that you used, maybe like, um, I don't know, like the MDF, whatever, <laughs> authentication, maybe it could recognize that and actually try to decrypt. I am not 100% sure if it does that or if that happens. But something else I wanted to show you is, okay, so it's not here. When we go to the classification kind of approach, when you do any form of classification, it gives you like a confidence level. Maybe the type of output it has given you, it's some of the decryption and encryption kind of text, it can give you its confidence level. So if it has noticed you're trying to do some form of encryption and decryption, maybe, maybe give you, if you have some encrypted and decrypted text, you could try and give it just a few examples and see if the output is what you expect. I think that it will be easier just to put the platform into into test and, and try it. I think let's say that I hope you've opened you've opened Kobe and have access to to what I'm doing. Okay, so there are another big company. So sorry guys for including you. I don't know if you guys have heard of Duolingo. So I use it every single day. I use Duolingo every single day. It's the application that I use to learn to learn French. And I didn't know until today that they actually use the GPT-3 LLM to like do the corrections. And sometimes you just, cause how Duolingo works, it gives you maybe like a text in French and you do your reading with whatever has accent. Maybe it gives you uh, an English test sentence and you do like a French translation of the same. So sometimes you do some grammatical errors. Maybe you are supposed to type an S which type a B and it recognizes that and it still gives it like, yes, this is okay because grammatical errors do happen. So all the corrections that are happening in that app, they're actually being run based on the GPT-3 LLM. So the other kind of application we'd like to go through is another big application called Viable. So this has actually been added in one of your, of your reference papers and um, like how LLMs come in handy, you might find like there are these big companies, let's say for example like Amazon, where they get a lot of feedback from their, from their users. And the feedback could be a compliment, the feedback could be a complaint, it could be, there are so many things. But since the feedback comes in a lot, it would be, it would not be logic to just put one person and be like, look at the at the feedback and tell us which one we need to focus on so this company called viable they came up with this like uh, at an api based on gpt3 as well it just takes a lot of customer feedback and then it generates like a summary for you and gives the insights from the feedback that uh, that that it was fed so i've added an example of a report generated by by viable and from a lot of a lot of customer input, it could actually either either maybe classify it as either a compliment, a complaint, or maybe I don't know. It does it in three: a compliment, complaint, or something else. I I think I've forgotten. And then it just gives you like a graph, maybe how many compliments are there, and what is the urgency. So of course, for compliments, if it is in the case of a feedback kind of approach, there's no need to work on compliments. You need to work on things like uh, complaints. So maybe it will give an, an agency of height or complaint and maybe an agency of flow to a compliment. So I think this would be like uh, something else you could, uh, you could uh, call or borrow from for this week. So you could say maybe you are trying maybe to classify these job descriptions and then you're trying to give it like a score. So maybe, I don't know, if you put an output, maybe if it has um, like a score as, as above a certain threshold, like maybe if the score of the um, of the predictions, maybe if the confidence level is um, above seventy percent, then there's a high chance that this the description is actually about maybe that specific topic or that specific. So Johans is asking, so I'm just going ahead and answering the questions as they come. So Johans is asking that the results when I tried the translation was close, yeah. 
the question is how can we improve it? So a way of improving it is maybe by giving it a few more examples, just a little bit more. And the other thing would be like to tailor your pattern, to tailor your questions, like the question that you're giving it in a specific, like easily recognizable kind of pattern. So when I did it the first time, it was close, but when I did it the second time, your hands, it is exactly what I was expecting. I don't know if you noticed, after just uh, tailoring, giving it a few more question, answer, question, answer, and everything, I did get the exact response no. I was expecting for that hey. translation. So just tailor your inputs, maybe like, yes. uh, so this week you already have okay. like, um, a labeled data. So if you notice, okay, it's not performing well. I don't know. I don't know if you are actually allowed to do some form of uh, processing, maybe cleaning. Maybe in your data you have some some inputs that don't have a label, so it has like an empty label. Maybe that will be affecting your model. Maybe if you do some form of cleaning and get rid of that, your model will actually maybe improve. So your data just needs to be with a recognizable kind of pattern. Remember, it's not a human being; it's still a machine. It needs to see that pattern before it does any form of prediction. Okay, and that's it about LLMs. I don't know if there's any question about LLMs or we can go to text-based image generating models. So, in China, you're asking if there's a limit to the amount of data we can put. Uh, I, I have not had of a limit of data, but the idea is that you don't need to give it a lot of data because it's it already has a lot of data that it has been trained on. So you don't need to give it like huge amount of data. It has already seen some data. And as long as there's a pattern in your existing data, just trust that it will actually give you a good kind of prediction. So you could give it as much data, but there's no need. That's the point why we have this in lens. If you could just have a lot of data, then go ahead and make your own model. But we're using LLM because it has already seen a lot. Okay, so okay, so given the two languages are well developed and have a huge amount of resources, when it comes African languages, can you translate the same way? So of course it depends on the input it has been. So we could just try, I, I don't know Amharic, we could try Amharic, I know that is not as common, but maybe I could also try Swahili. I could also try Swahili, I don't know, Swahili tends to be tough when you want to do pure Swahili for me. So let me just try and see. So if someone is saying I can look in Rwanda, unless you give me the question and the answer, uh, okay, uh, if you give me the question and the answer, then I'll just guess because for sure I don't know any Rwanda. And how many Rwanda? I think Egypt will give us that. So okay, so the question there. How are you? How are you? Then say Amakuru. Where do you read? Let's translate to Alpha. I interchanged what, Amanuel? That's me or. Um... What is your name again? The result. So what are, what are we trying to predict? Oh, you wanted the answer in English. Oh, okay. Let's first see this if it will actually recognize. How old are you? So what kind of answer are we expecting? Is it? Uh, the, the can you round off this? Yes. Uh, 
me try it. I don't know if you can still see my screen. It's giving me an output. What I end. <laughs> Does this make sense? Yes. No, no, no. Nothing is close to the to the answer we have. So nothing here is Kinyarwanda actually. Okay. Mm, let me try to do something. So let me first remove that. Give this like a thing. Let me remove that. No, but that's important. I don't know. But I don't know if this. I was thinking maybe to give it the language at the top. I don't know if that would help. I don't think it would. What is my language? Like, yeah. Yeah. is actually like a, a Kinyarwanda word as well. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, let's see if that will work. Hey, EB. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like yeah. Bantu language, but it's not Kinyarwanda. <laughs> Okay, so most likely this model has not seen in a Rwanda kind of output. Yeah, maybe we could have tried another language. I don't know if, I don't know if we have. I don't know if so it would be developed. Let's see. So we have so Somebody saying it's actually in a Rwanda. Have you seen that wrong? And of course, the spelling mistake do do they have an impact on your model? So maybe I wrote, I wrote that wrong. How are you? How are you? How is that reading? So I Kenyan. Uh, what's the Swahili for that? Kenyan. Kaligan. Kaligan. Anywhere do you live? No, but this is the one. What is the name of the two? Oh no, we're, 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 we're looking for how old are we? <laughs> okay, so it did give an, an output, which is Swahili. But it's funny because it's asking to translate, it's asking like, what are these? So let's say it funny. I don't know. Maybe most likely it has it has not seen this developed language of African language, which is bad. So unless 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 maybe you have, you are you, you fine tune that model and actually give it Kenya Rwanda kind of data set or like a Swahili kind of data set. So that would actually go ahead to like a fine tuning that kind of model. So you just give it a labeled data set, and it will learn again from that. <laughs> so I hear you on set in I don't know why it's saying that. That's, that's a training Swahili, that's a training Swahili. But, but yeah. Okay, so let's continue. So to the text-based I hope that I hope we can end there for the lens and just go quickly over the text with the generating method. Okay. How about text-based image generating model? So the big thing, it's just like an LLM, but the text-based, you just give it like a textual description 
and then it generates an image for you. So I've just actually learned that a lot, there are a lot of images that were just like AI generated. Companies like uh, we'll see at the end, like Google, they are using images generated from text to perform a few things. So an example of a text-based image generating model is again, OpenAI has this uh, model called DAL-E. And just like the LLMs, these are also trained on deep learning. So like neural network kind of uh, base algorithms and uh, how you train them. And like when you are doing the, the previous LLMs, you are giving them a labeled kind of data. But for this text-based generating models, you actually give it an image and a text. So it could be a text of an entire description of that image. And then it just learns to relate that text, whatever is on that text with that image. So when it is given, when it is given a lot of input, like you see here, you give it a lot of text. At the same time, you give it a lot of image. Then it is going to learn how to associate the images with the text. It's a pair of an image and a text. Then when you maybe you want to do some form of classification later, you just give it like a name. And then from how it had learned, of course, that name it tries to to find the image for that name. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Does that make sense, guys? Are you guys still there? Maybe I'm in a debug again. We can hear you, but uh, I, I don't, I didn't understand. So I don't know what that is. Okay. So what, what I'm saying about the text based image generating mm -hmm. the planning models, mm -hmm. you train them, they are also pre-trained. That is the idea of this large language models and just the text, uh, text based generating mm -hmm. image. They are pre-trained. But how you pre-train a text-based uh, image generating model, you give it an image text pair where the text is like a description of what that image is about. So for example, you could have like an image of a dog maybe running for a frisbee in a garden, whatever, in a green garden, and you write a, a very descriptive text of what that image is. Then you, you have, of course, a lot of this, a lot of the text and the images uh, that are tied to each other. Then you just pre-train your model with, with this. Then when you do your prediction later, now what we are coming to use, something already pre-trained, you just give it like a name and it goes through its entire data set and tries to say, okay, so you've said a dog, so which image is most likely of a dog and gives you that dog? Maybe you said I need a dog that is that is white and so you give it another description of what you want later. It goes ahead to its data and say, okay, so this is a dog. So it needs to be white, it understands white, so it makes it white. Maybe it should be in a cocoon. So it finds a cocoon, it has a blank what cocoon looks like and puts that white dog in a cocoon and give you an output. If that's better. Does that make it better in Kenan? I suspect because you, you mentioned your work that was not clear for you. Yes, for me it's better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I hope the others have also got, got that. Because next, uh, giving like an example. These are images generated by Dal E, the Open AI's um, text-based image generating DL model. And the description given, like the input, was just simple, like an armchair in the shape of an avocado. So it knows how armchairs looks like. It also knows how an avocado looks like. The fact that you give it an armchair in the shape of an avocado, it tries to put the two together and give you an image output. And you can see that. 
Okay, honestly, it's indeed well. You see, most of these look, yes, like avocados, but they're still chairs. So it's a true description of what is given. Same thing down here, you can see another example, an illustration of a baby daikon, radish in a tutu walking adult. So yes, you see, so it, you need an, in a, in a, in a, in a, an illustration. So of course it is, okay, that's an image. You need a baby daikon radish. So of course you can see in each and every image is a baby daikon radish, of course, different kind of things. And then, so it's, it's in a tutu. So it's, it's all of them are wearing some sort of a skirt called a tutu. Of them, and then walking a dog. So that's why you see with a dog and there's a tie attached to it. So it just tries to come up with that image based on how descriptive the message is. I hope that's clear. Let me get some fun images just to show you how you can actually generate an image. Okay. So it goes at the prone, at the pros of synthetic image generation, like why in the hell would someone need this kind of model? Just to answer that question, why would you need to generate a model? And one of the things could be like, maybe there's a scarcity or uh, you don't have enough data when you are trying to maybe create your model, not to train your model. So you're training your model, you're training it on image kind of data. If you don't have enough, enough images to train your model, so maybe you already have uh, real, real images, like 50 of them, and maybe you wanted like 100. So you just come up with descriptions, textual descriptions of what you want. Feed it into this model, and it gives you the images. Then you put it into your, your model, and you train it, and you get, you get an output. Another reason as to why you could do this approach is uh, like for the conversational chatbots. So you notice. Like, um, I don't know if you guys have any, I, I have a chat box in my phone. I think it's, I think it's, it uses the box because there's no way they're always there when I just text. And uh, so most of the questions are just like directed. Maybe you're saying this input, it gives you an output. And sometimes your input is a word and it generates, it gives you an output in the form of, of an image just to explain a few things maybe that, that you asked it. And that image is most likely generated by like a it's most like a synthetic and synthetic image. It's not a real image. It's just depending on your question, depending on the context of what you're discussing, it just comes up with an image and it uses that as an output for you to actually understand. So somewhere else you can actually use is uh, to add more variation to your existing image data set. So yes, you could already have data and it's a lot. But you find you are training your like an animal recognition kind of model, and you have images. So all your images are just dogs. So there's no variation in your image. Maybe you wanted to have dogs, cats, rabbits, cows, and the rest. If you only have dogs, the rest of the images you don't need to struggle to find them. You can just generate them and add them to your data set. And finally, something else I have to mention is that you can actually create images that are copyright free. So most of the time these days, if you use somebody's image, especially on a platform like Medium, and you do not recognize them in your in your blog, that's actually copyright infringement. So instead of actually being sued for copyright issues, you can just generate an image, use it on your work, in your blog or whatever, and just move forward. So of course, cons, some of the bad issues about synthetic image, and um, somebody can actually create a doctored image, something like uh, it's fake, and then use it to deceive the public. So you might find, because I've just seen images that generate like portraits, Hello. portraits of people, yes. and your, your image could be generated oh, and put in a scenario where you are never there oh, yeah. at all. And that image, if somebody cannot be able to tell that this is actually a fake image, they can actually be accused of something that you not even do it. Because it's an image of you somewhere, you are never there, but there's an image of you there. So if you cannot, if you cannot be able to detect if it's a fake or not, so you can just end up being accused. So that's, of course, one of the cons. And then something else is, which I've said, I think, twice, you can generate the synthetic image. 
to add on to your data set. So you could find maybe the way you created the textual description was not that good. So the images are not of the highest quality. And instead of informing your model, like you are targeting to, it could end up misleading your model and just making your model perform really poor. It keeps saying that lions are cats just because of the kind of inputs that you get. Have that scale. Just to finish, I've given a one-on-one -on -one application, an example of a company that is uh, at the moment generating synthetic images. So like to help it in its day to day. So we have this Google demo where they generate these images to test like it's like I giving it an example of a road, just how a road would look like. Maybe there are obstacles and you can see on the upper image here. Everything here is just this is a random lead, it's a synthetic image for sure. And they're like blocks everywhere which have also been put there synthetically. But your car, self-driving car, it only needs that kind of a map. So even if this like you have a scenario with a lot of rocks, and I don't know, and you want your this self-driving car to be able to adapt to this kind of um, environment, you could just synthetically generate that image and then feed that image to your self-driving test, test, test car. Instead of maybe going to get all the images of I don't know how many how many corners in the world, you could just think of something. Oh, I did see this somewhere in Cape Town, and just come up with a nice description of how that would look like and uh, feed it into the model. So I think tomorrow we have a class on this. We'll be using uh, this This one, Mid Journey. We'll be using Mid Journey tomorrow and just get to see how we can get a, a lot of images. For those who are in the remote class, again, he shared an image generated by Mid Journey for the celebration of New Year's in Ethiopia. And that was just a textual description of what that person needed, fed into Mid Journey the platform, and then they got that celebration. So I haven't been able to figure out with Jan, I can see them to you. But I did see this application again, it's called it's a deep AI. I think deep AI, they also have that kind of deep AI. They also have that kind of uh, approach where you give it a textual description and it gives you some form, some form of image. So I just kept on testing. I didn't know I could run out of what should I say? I have to pay test again but I just put my description here and then it gives me an so maybe I'll just share this maybe some of you can try it I can no longer try it I have finished every every copy let me just share So you could just try that. That's an example. Tomorrow we'll go to that example called uh, Meet Journey with Nados. Just go through it and see how this works. But that's an example of how text-based image generating kind of API. That's how they work. And uh, we keep mentioning things like DALI, which you've seen they really have nice photos, the summation codex, the summation GPT. And while they are really good example and excelling in the market, they're also very, very expensive. I don't know if we'll get the best chance to actually experiment with them this week, but because they're really, really expensive just to use. And you'll also notice, for example, for platforms like Kovia that I was just using, when I am playing with their playground, and I'm just using their playground here they don't charge me but immediately i take the api for what you guys maybe you i'm just using like the ui version 
but of course, as a coder, the best thing is just to use the API. API, and of course, you just come down here and you set up an, an API key that you you use in your code. You'll notice. Let me say, for example, let me go to like the classification kind of kind of work. And so here we already have some kind of data here. Okay, so this is good. And maybe let me just classify this. Yes, and we have an output. So when I get this kind of code, this is a Python kind of code. You'll notice here that this cohere.client and then the API key. So to be able to do this coding from like your terminal or from your VS code, just from any IDE you are using, you need the API key for cohere. And uh, so you need to generate the API key. Something that you just need to note is that, for example, like Cohere, when you use your API key, I think you get charged. I think the API key charges. I'm not sure. I did see some form of um, pricing somewhere. Yeah, pricing somewhere. I don't think I can track it anymore. But it's only charged for the API key. You can just use Playground, understand it, know very well. Okay, so this is how it works. But when it comes to using the API key, just be considerate on what you're doing so that, yeah, because it's charged. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it is anymore. But I did see that the API key has been charged. So just go to this platform and um, experiment with it. You see here we have like the hashtag generator, which gives you an input. You don't have to keep thinking of the, of the inputs. So it gives you some input, and you can just generate. You see what kind of hashtag you can generate. Product descriptions and it has a number of descriptions. So, we want a description for this. So, you generate the description and voila, it has a description for you. So, this is just examples of uh, generation. So, what Cohere, for example, does, which I think is a nice platform that you guys can interact with because again, the playground is cheaper. You could use it either to do some form of generation some form of word, word embedding, where it just gives like, uh, like a cluster of like a grouping of, um, of related, of like statements in a related kind of context, embedding, and then also some form of uh, classification, which is now what the, the, the three give. Okay, and with that, I'd say that's the end. I hope you've understood. I don't think there's anything else in that presentation. Yep, that's it. So for those who are also like, you really want to try this on your own, I've added a reference for like synthetic image generation. This is done by the platform. I've added here a platform called Clip. There's a platform called Clip. And that specific reference added at the end takes you through like the pre-training kind of approach, like a clip kind of model. So if you really want to see okay, what happens in the back, that specific article gives you like a walkthrough, a technical walkthrough of the things you can get to also set up your own kind of language model, you know, a text-based kind of generative model, and then you just get to test it. So, yeah, we'll just, yeah, just do something with installation. installation so funny. It gives you all the code that you can just use to train your model. Of course, again, if you have a really nice heavy machine that can handle the deep learning, just use the deep learning, maybe increase the number of efforts, and then you try to do some form of prediction. The prediction here was too bad. Maybe they were trying to do a sample of a dog. Yeah. Or something it's like a dog. But again, it wasn't as clear, but they are giving me a reason of I think they used much less number of yeah, much less number of epoch. So you could just maybe increase that. So yeah, Henok is nice. asking if we don't need why uh, GPU for this. So yeah, we could actually use you need GPUs most of the time when you're doing a deep learning. Mm -hmm. And if your machine cannot take it, you can do this in Colab. I think Colab, Colab gives you some GPU. It gives you some GPU. Yes. 
I think yeah, Colab yeah. does give you some GPU functionality. Okay, I'm not, I don't see it in, in every new and new but I do think that Collab gives you some form of GPU. Something else you guys will notice from the, from the references shared with you. I'm noticing it's, you know, it always gives us just RAM and I think RAM and something. I've never seen GPU, but I do think but I do think that yeah, it only gives you some RAM space and some disk space. But I do think I do think that Collab gives you the GPU ability. Or I don't know if you have to pay. But I don't know if those songs we used to deep learning last week on Collab did it run like the TensorFlow? I think it just ran. Yeah, it does give GPUs. Collab does give GPUs. Something else I wanted to mention. When you look at the challenge document given to you, when you go to the reference section, there's something that has been mentioned down here on petals. And what petals are, they just try to give this form of like a shared kind of GPU. So if you have some GPU on your machine, of course, maybe you don't have something highly capable to train an entire model. So if you just have some GPU space, you could actually just join people and volunteer some of your GPU. When you volunteer some of your GPU, you also get access to the GPU used by, should I say, other volunteers in this kind of platform. So I don't know how they're used, but yeah, Petal gives you this kind of probability. I don't know if we will get to go through a class on that. I don't know if class on that. I don't think there's a class on petals. Okay. So if you want to train on GPU, go and explore petals, see how you can use them to your advantage get that GPU hosted by others and get into training. Okay. Any other question? Any other question? Does that make it a little bit clearer for the week? Like the things you've just gone through? Guys, does it make it a little bit clearer? Could we just end and say that yes, it's clear and just go on with the day? Any feedback from you? Did that make it clear? Does anyone have any question? If it's clear, maybe just say it's clear, then we can just go and end it there. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so to, to, to clarify, I, I don't understand completely what we are supposed to do. Are we supposed to write the code that uses one of these uh, um, uh, like um websites to do this or like using like a cohere or something to to do classification is it you are supposed to you are supposed to do 
Yeah, so it's, yes, it's writing some form of code, but it's mainly getting that API key maybe from like Cohere, I think the platform that I know about now, getting that API key. And since you already have, you've been given two data sets, a training data set and a testing data set, so you could just uh, fine tune an already existing model in Cohere using your training data set. And then when you train, when you train a model, when you fine tune a model in Cohere, it also gives you like that code for that fine tuned model. Then you can also get that fine tuned model, feed it to your testing data and get the classification output. Uh, I didn't hear the part about the API key. What about the API key? The API key is what you use on your code to be able to interact with the large language model given by yeah. Cohere. Also, the API key will help you interact with your fine-tuned model from a platform like Cohere. And we were given this uh, in the with the material we provided, or are we supposed to get each of us get the, their own? No, no, I think you need to get your own API key. You'll get your own API key, as I said down here. It's a way of getting the like, create yes. an API key. So let me see job descriptions. Job descriptions. So here I have a new API key that I can use to access for here with. Okay, okay, clear now, thank you. Yeah, and I think when you follow that, this document, there's, um, <laughs> there's I saw one on like the step step of what exactly you need to do with Cohere. Um, fish, I do think there are other options. We, do, we just don't have to use just Cohere. There are other options. I'm just mentioning Cohere because I think I've gotten comfortable with this specific platform. So I don't know. Is there, is there something that you mentioned mentioned on a specific platform? So I think on task one, when you go into a little bit of understanding the fundamentals, <coughs> we get here um, algorithms like what to so when you get into deep dive of like the the task one, you'll get uh, a few a few models that have been stated. You have the GPT two three OPT Bloom. So when you when you are doing a deep search, and you notice okay Bloom maybe is free, cheaper, and performs better than here. I think you can just go ahead and use it. I'm thinking for GPT-3, you have to pay for the services. So if you, if you can also pay, <laughs> well, it could. But uh, I don't know if they have the free version. I'm not so sure if they have a free, free version. Yeah, but it's just good to go to details of GPT-3 because they are very, they're very advanced and they'll just give you an understanding of just what large language models are in general, how they work, and just how to deeply understand them. So don't just skip over the GPT-3 papers because you want to be using GPT-3. It will actually help you understand LLMs a lot. Yeah, so as I was saying, as I was saying in Tinan, there's a paper. I went through these papers and there's one specific that shows you on the, on the, on the commands to use it for here. I think this is it. Yeah, how to train your pet. This is it. How to train your pet LLM. Prompt engineering. So it's prompt. Okay, that's not it. Playgrounds. 
open API. Okay, I'm not sure in general which API it is, but I have seen it. I don't think it's just such a link. It's one of, one of these references. It's one specific on using the APIs. The APIs we are uh, here. If I get the exact the exact one, I'll share. But yeah, for sure it is in one of these different scopes. Any other question, guys? Okay, so are we also, are we saying we're okay, we can end the class here? So like Edibal said, from today to Wednesday, it will mainly be just understanding these platforms, what are LLMs. So just go and uh, read a lot of papers, just experiment with these platforms, do a report of what you understand about the platforms, about the papers. And you'll be good to go by Wednesday. Then from Thursday, or maybe if you start earlier, that's when we'll get into more the field tuning and trying to do some kind of classification. So as I will say, it's a fun week. Try to have fun with this new knowledge. It's an upcoming industry. It's of course something in AI. If you're doing to do machine learning without doing all the steps in machine learning, that is that is very nice. Thing. So I just go and experiment with the platforms given, and um, yeah, happy coding, happy learning for this week.